prostate is as good a place as any to start. So uh, I think a lot of people watched uh, the Mark Bell Power Project podcast with uh, Dr. Andrew Huberman on there, and he talked about you know, he had used some of these peptides under medical supervision, of course, um, and had an increase in his PSA, so quit taking them. So then mm-hmm. we had all sorts of people asking us about, you know, is growth hormone growing the prostate? Is this, you know, real? What's going on here? Uh, so uh, I guess a good way to unpack that is, you know, uh, what does, what are the effects of growth hormone peptides? What are they? Uh, just at, at a base level for people who have may mm-hmm. have never heard of these things. And then what are they typically used for um, and who should not use them? This is a great discussion and we'll do our best to refine it down to a pithy amount of content. But growth hormone in and of itself um, is a peptide hormone. So it's both a peptide, a string of amino acids, and a hormone signaling molecule as well. So there is a, um, I suppose you could call it a landmark study in the New England Journal of Medicine probably about 30 years ago. And it was on growth hormone and its effect on increasing lean body mass and decreasing body fat in older individuals. And then after that, there was kind of that cascade of off-label growth hormone treatment. And then after that, as um, the dangers of using growth hormone, think of it, uh, in Kansas, we might describe it as the shotgun of hormones. Uh, growth agonist in many different systems. And then, of course, it, it's a kind of like offspring, for, better, for lack of a better term, IGF-1. So IGF-1 and growth hormone um, are affecting all these different systems in the body, including the prostate, including adipose tissue, including body mass. And it has many different hormones. It kind of reminds me of thyroid hormone because of the different systems that it works in. Right. It's very nonspecific. It's going to act on tissues whether you want it to or not. So when you look at like how anabolic growth hormone really is, what, what we seem to see in the data is that it actually just increases your rate of whole body protein mm-hmm. synthesis. And you know, the biggest thing that I think people see there um, is with connective tissue. Yep. Um, so, you know, over time, you know, people are taking these peptides and anecdotally what you hear is improvements in sleep quality, improvements in how your, your joints feel. And that may not be the, the root cause. A lot of people are taking these things. And they don't really have a growth hormone deficiency. Mm-hmm. It's probably better to look at, you know, muscle imbalances. Lots of people have um, lower back issues, just sitting yep. a lot, uh, tight hamstrings, things like that that you can solve without exposing yourself to uh, a lot of these are still you know, experimental compounds are kind of in a, a gray area or FDA approved for testing for a growth hormone deficiency, but not mm-hmm. to treat a growth hormone deficiency. Um, so a lot of these are off-label prescriptions, just like all prescriptions, a large percentage are actually off-label because they have additional uses. So yeah, I think it's very non-specific, similar to you know, mm-hmm. thyroid hormone. And yeah, I've heard some people talk about, you know, when might it be a good time to use these things. And uh, for somebody that has you know, good insulin sensitivity, that's a good candidate yep. for this. Uh, someone around the time of a, a surgery, perhaps, that they want to you know, heal up from faster. You know, mm-hmm. Maybe there's some instances where that makes sense. There if is. you're 20 years old, you're going to heal up from surgery just fine. You've already got... Hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully. Yeah, I shouldn't say always, uh, but... Uh, you're going to get plenty of growth hormone, more than likely, you know, 20, 30 years old. But if for somebody, you know, older, you know, maybe more frail, you really want to make sure that they, they heal up and give them the best shot, yep. um, then that can make sense for a short period of time. It yep. makes me very nervous when I see people and they're like, oh, yeah, I've been on this for five years nonstop because that's a lot of growth signaling. And there's mm-hmm. not just positives to being you know, anabolic and growth signaling. Yep. There's some risks as well. Yeah, there's a lot of debate between different molecules that are growth agonist or that are oh, hormetic. And often those are, there's a balance between the two. So you want a decent amount of hormesis. So some people might be familiar with sirtuins or basically um, a state of, um, not a hibernation state, but a state where you're not overly anabolic. It gives your body a chance and your immune system a chance to look for things like precancerous or cancerous cells and take care of them via endogenous immunotherapy, if you will. Whereas the growth molecules will speed up cell cycling so much, and growth hormone is just one of them. A lot of the other ones that are talked about are things like CJC, or Samorlin, Ipomorelin, Ibutamorin, and these basically come down to two different classes of molecules. You can refer to all of them as GHRPs, but you either have your uh, ghrelin agonists, which increase growth hormone via a G-protein coupled receptor that was later found to be related to ghrelin, 
and then your GHRHs, which are essentially synthetic versions of GHRH with just a couple amino acids changed. Yeah, and I think it's important for people to realize that in true growth hormone deficiency, these peptides, the secretagogues are, are going to be less likely. I wouldn't say they would never work to treat a growth hormone deficiency, yep. uh, but they would be less likely to work because the, pro the reason you have a growth hormone deficiency is mm -hmm. the pituitary is not putting out the hormones like it Correct. should be. Um, and there's things that can present as a growth hormone deficiency if all you're looking at is an IGF-1 level. Yes. Uh, for example, if somebody is in a, a steep calorie deficit, yep. uh, they're going to have a low IGF-1, not a lot of growth and anabolism going on. If somebody is uh, restricting carbohydrates very low, you're going to not you're going to have a lack of insulin signaling in mm -hmm. the liver, you're not going to produce as much IGF-1. So if you're not taking a careful history, you may be trying to do a good thing and then over-diagnosing yep. people with growth hormone yep. deficiency when in reality people that are you know, fasting, uh, people with low insulin signaling, they tend to have hypersecretion of yep. growth hormone. A uh, great example of this is type 1 diabetics. Great example. Yeah, so uh, if your IGF-1 is low or high or even normal, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're in the optimal range. There's even other things to take into account. So just like you have total testosterone and free testosterone and total thyroid hormone and free thyroid hormones, you also have total IGF-1 or just IGF-1 and free IGF-1 that is not bound to the many binding peptides, somewhat analogous to SHBG for sex steroid hormones. So when you're starting a treatment, there's a couple pitfalls. One is that Perhaps you just have a very low level of IGF BP3, or which is a lot genetic, or IGF BP1. A lot of individuals are familiar with that because metformin can affect IGF BP1 as well, and especially your lifestyle affects it from time to time. So that one needs to be taken fasting for sure. But anyway, you have a much higher risk of things like prostate cancer if your IGF BP3 levels are off. So your actual gene transcription can be dysregulated even with a normal IGF-1. Similar to how you can have a normal testosterone, but very low gene transcription or very high gene transcription at the androgen receptor that we talked about in a recent podcast. Yeah, it, I think it really is analogous to the sex hormone binding globulin. There's binding proteins for you know, essentially lots of different hormones in the body. And you could have a lower level of binding protein, and you're going to have more, just, just call it growth signaling yep. uh, in the prostate, for example. And you don't want to be in that you know, upper tertile or you know, the, even out of the range of the IGF-1, especially if you have low IGF-1 binding proteins, mm -hmm. because we do see that that's correlated with you know, incidences of cancer later on in life. And you know, we can talk about the correlation isn't causation, yep. but... There's some pretty compelling data when you look at the pathology on you know, different tumors, cancer cells, atypical cells that would tend to overexpress things like growth hormone receptors, yep. IGF-1 receptors, and in Vegf. general, yeah, yeah, Vegf vasculogenesis as well. That's yeah. a pretty potent combo. Yeah. They love growth, anything, yeah, anything that's going to promote growth. Yep, NMN even. Yeah, in theory, some of the the NAD precursors, the NMN, um, NR. Those things could have mild you know, carcinogenic, I wouldn't say carcinogenic, but could promote the growth of an already mm -hmm. existing cancer. It's another stick on the fire of a growth agonist stack. <laughs> yeah, the, the pro-cancer stack. Yeah. And we know that people that have lower levels of IGF-1, they do tend to live longer. So you want to, in general, do things that are mm -hmm. associated with you know, healthier outcomes. You know, like yeah eating your vegetables, eating your fiber. You can argue about correlation all day long, but the data's pretty darn compelling.